Are you ready? Look real close. I'm gonna show you a video. I want you to think about what you're watching. What's happening? Why is maybe this unusual? Okay, here it comes. You ready? Let's go ahead and watch this. Look real closely. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Maybe if you have a pencil, a notepad, write it down. Something's happening here, but what is it? Where is he going? Did you write something down? If you're not paying attention, look real closely. Right now, keep an eye on him. Wow. That was awesome. That was also a video that was shot just last week, right where I'm standing, or sitting rather, right here on the shores of the Hudson Bay. I'm Kyle Shutt with Discovery Education. I am so glad that you're with us learning today because there are polar bears like the one you're seeing right there, or the two, I should say. They're alive on the shores of Hudson Bay outside of Church Hill, Manitoba. And I'm joined with two fascinating scientists from Polar Bears International that are going to share so much with you. We have Elisa McCall. Hi there, say hello. Hi, hi everyone, I'm Elisa. I'm one of the staff scientists and the Director of Conservation Outreach at Polar Bears International. Okay. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm Joanna Sulik and I'm a consulting scientist with Polar Bears International. And I would love for you two to share, at least if you can start, what was so fascinating? The students probably wrote a whole bunch of things down with that polar bear that was wandering the, the shoreline. If you notice, one of the things I noticed, there was water that was, so was not solid. It was liquid, right? But now there's ice out there. What else was going on just last week that you noticed? Right, so if you were watching really closely, you might have seen something in that water. If you know what a polar bear's favorite food is, then you know that polar bears love to hunt seals. And there are seals, of course, swimming all over here, but it's so hard for polar bears to catch them in open water. Polar bears need sea ice to get to those seals. And this is an example of why. So you see that seal on the left there? And this polar bear is gonna try to get the seal, but the seals swam away. The seals are so much faster than polar bears. So the polar bear's really waiting for that ice. So this polar bear wanted to eat that seal, wasn't lucky that day. So they're waiting for the ice to freeze up here so they can be successful at hunting next time. It's so incredible to see the weather and the seasonal mm -hmm. changes. I want you students, I want you to join us today, okay? You're going to help us to bust some myths, identify mm -hmm. some facts, and look at these bears. They're rolling around. Why are they doing that? <laughs> Right? That's something I would be writing down. Is that normal? Right? Let's try to find some of that out. We're so fortunate to be joining Polar Bears International once again from Buggy One, here live on the shores of the Hudson Bay. And as we watch that polar bear, I want you to understand a little bit of how far away from these bears. Wow, look at that. Okay, let's just pause. We, I can't miss that. <laughs> Joanna, please tell us, what, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? Sure. I mean, Polar bears around here, they're waiting for sea ice that, we've, um, that is going to you know, form any day now. And they are really hungry. They have not been eating for a long time. And that's a good chance for them to kind of get the, some of the energy out and practice the things that they're quite important for them. And one of those things that is important for male polar bears is fighting each other. And it's going to com come real handy in spring when they try to get females and mate with them. And now it's actually an ex excellent opportunity for them to, you know, spot with each other, bump each other a little <laughs> bit. It's not too violent, but it's, you know, a good play and they can go get really um, agitated and excited, but they don't hurt each other really. They just use the opportunity of the fact that they can meet all together and spar a bit, train a bit before this sp uh, spring time when those skills come real handy. It's so amazing to me. We, of course, are here whenever we can to show polar bears in their native habitat. And <laughs> only now and then do you get bears sparring in real time while you're talking. I can't even get through some of my introduction here <laughs> because I want to point to the bears outside. So awesome, so incredibly awesome. Okay, so students, as we go, we have a game for you. It's myth or fact. So starting off, these two bears here, myth or fact, they might see a penguin sometime in their life. 
What do you think? I'm waiting for you. Write it down, whisper to a neighbor, who are you sitting next to? These polar bears here, they might see a penguin in their life. Alisa, can you go ahead and answer that one? Well, they will not see a penguin in their life because penguins only live in the South Pole. And Joanna can back me up because she lived in Antarctica. Did you ever see a penguin? Or a oh. polar bear? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, something. yeah, I mean, I was thinking, as you were asking the question, will those bears ever see a penguin? I mean, ooh, tricky. Because once I, you know, if you maybe bring a penguin toy up here and show it to the <laughs> bears from the buggy, Trick like, look question. guys, those things live on the other side of the globe from you. And I think, well, the, the, the general question is like, no, it's really unlikely that those bears are going to see the penguin unless somebody really helps them at it. Because bears live on top of the planet, which is the Arctic, and uh, penguins live on exactly opposite in the Arctic, Antarctic. And as Arctic Ocean is really surrounded by land and brown bears could, you know, with evolution, uh, polar bears evolved from brown bears and could adapt to this very cold climate on top of the planet. Antarctica is really a continent surrounded by ocean. So penguins, birds, could, like their ancestors could fly there and then land on land, see there's no land carnivores, no land predators, and then actually lose their flight abilities and nest safely on, in Antarctica. So actually, one of the reasons why penguins are not uh, able to fly is because there's no bears in Antarctica. Isn't that fascinating? Wow, wow. Okay, well, to give some perspectives <laughs> of numbers and distances, um, do you have any idea? So I looked this up, by the way. I know you're from Longyear Bien, Svalbard, Norway. Is that, that That's right? where okay. I live, yes. Do you have any idea how far away from where you, Whew. from where your home is, uh, we are right now? I traveled three days. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's more than... It's some thousands. It is. It certainly is. For the uh, the students joining us in the states, it's about two thousand five hundred miles, or over four thousand. Uh, I'm sorry, about uh, yeah, over four thousand kilometers. Wow. Yeah. How about that? Um, now, Elisa, joining us from <laughs> Canada, from Whitehorse, where you live, to here. Do you have any idea how far away it is? Kyle, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, I looked this one up too. Don't worry. So it is about twenty three hundred kilometers, or one thousand four hundred miles, from here to your home. Now. I'm joining from outside of Philadelphia, that's where I live, and that, so it took me three days, should have been two, we don't have to get into that story <laughs> right now, um, but that's about 1,500 miles away, okay, or 2,400 kilometers. We have students today joining us from Miami, I looked this one up by the way, if you're in Florida, anywhere in the Miami area, you're about 2,400 miles, or 3,800 kilometers from where we are. We also have students from Los Angeles, California, so for those students, hello to all Hi. you on the West Coast, mm -hmm. you're about 2,000 miles away, or wow. 3,300 kilometers. So we're a little bit far north right now, and we're so excited that you're joining us. In fact, we want you to share in this experience with us, okay? So tell us where you're from. Go ahead, use Twitter. If you're on Twitter, tweet at Polar Bears and at Discovery Ed. Use that hashtag Tundra Connections, okay, teachers? Take a picture, take a photo. What does your learning environment look like where you're connecting with us from, okay? And of course, you can share your answers to myth or fact, because we have a whole bunch of those coming up throughout the show. All right, so here's another myth or fact as you're getting ready to answer questions. Of course, if you're in the chat window there, go ahead and post those there as well. Our social teams are, uh, are monitoring them, but here's your myth or fact. Are you ready, students? Okay. Myth or fact, there are four sea ice eco-regions. Did you come up with your answer? I'm not going to tell you. I want you to see if you can find out. Let's go ahead and watch this and learn a little bit more about sea ice regions and where polar bears live. Polar bears live across the circumpolar Arctic, primarily over the shallow, productive waters of the continental shelf. Their range includes five different nations, Norway, Greenland, Canada, the United States and Alaska, and Russia. This means that international cooperation is essential for understanding and conserving the species. The International Union for Conservation of Nature lists polar bears as vulnerable due to loss of sea ice habitat. Polar bears live pretty much anywhere there is Arctic sea ice. But not all sea ice is the same. It varies in thickness and extent. Generally, Thinner sea ice allows more sunlight to filter through, 
providing a critical ingredient for the photosynthesis of algae, which forms at the base of the Arctic food chain, resulting in areas with more ocean productivity. However, thicker sea ice is more stable and easier for polar bears and people to travel on. Scientists also think about sea ice as either multi-year or annual. Multi-year sea ice remains frozen year-round, whereas annual sea ice melts each summer and refreezes each fall. Over the last few decades, we have seen a significant decrease in both the thickness and extent of the Arctic sea ice, with an average loss of 13% per decade since 1978. Scientific models predict that if we continue on our current path, we will witness our first ice-free summer in the Arctic before the end of the century. Scientists have classified the types of sea ice in the polar bears range into four sea ice ecoregions. Seasonal, divergent, convergent and archipelago. The seasonal sea ice ecoregion is an area where sea ice melts each summer and refreezes each fall. Polar bears in this ecoregion are forced onto land each summer, where they are largely food deprived without access to their marine mammal prey. Melting sea ice due to climate warming is causing this on-land fasting period for polar bears to be longer and longer. So I'm sure you figured out the answer, right? Did you get it? Where are we? What sea ice ecoregion? Joanna, can you go ahead and explain what were those four regions and where are we? And why is it so special that we can be right here? Absolutely. So maybe we can take one recap and talk about Arctic Ocean and how, you know, we talk about the sea ice and it's actually a thin layer of frozen water on top of an entire basin of the ocean. So of course, if you think about it, like, you know, if you have a cup of hot chocolate you don't drink from, there's a film on top of it. And if you move the cup, then that film will all spin all around. And it's something similar is happening in the Arctic Ocean with sea ice. So when sea ice uh, forms, it then migrates with the ocean currents. And that explains the sea ice ecoregions that we just saw and we just talked about. So there is a sea ice ecoregion that is, you know, hit, taken with the current and taken away from the land, and it's the divergent uh, sea ice. Then this ice is pushed onto land where it converges, so we have the convergent sea ice ecotype. Then there is a sea ice that forms in between islands in the archipelago region, which is archipelago sea ice ecotype. And finally, there are areas where sea ice forms in autumn, lasts through winter and spring, but then melts completely during the summer season. And that happens right here in western Hudson Bay. And that's why the bear that we just saw last week couldn't hunt the seal because the sea ice was just not there yet. And look at us now, like we are sitting, you know, in a buggy looking outside the howling winds on the tundra and the sea ice is slowly creeping in. It's going to form any moment now, we're hoping. So you can really see how the seasons strongly affect this area and the sea ice that covers the, west, uh, the western Hudson Bay and the Hudson Bay. Absolutely. Thank you. And of course, I mentioned that we're in buggy one. So we're up in this roving polar bear, kind of like a school bus with monster truck tires. It's pretty fascinating. And we're near the town of Churchill, but it's a couple miles away, right? We've been driving over the shoreline. You can see there is an image right there of buggy one. So the bear, when it stands tall, Elisa, where would, how, how tall would a polar bear stand on that buggy? Well, it depends on the bear, but if you look at the back deck there, if a large bear were to stand on its hind feet and put his paws up, his nose could almost get to the top of the back deck there. But we are very safe uh, when we're up in the buggies. Absolutely. Okay, another myth or fact. Here it comes. Are you ready? There are more polar bears in Churchill this time of year than people. Myth or fact? Did you turn to a partner? Did you tell him the answer? Elisa, are there more polar bears than people? It's a bit of a myth. Uh, the town of Churchill itself is about 900 people, though of course we see a lot more people than that at this time of the year. And the western Hudson Bay polar bear population is between about eight and 900 bears. But it's important to note that not all of those bears are here right now, and definitely not all of those bears walk through the town of Churchill. Churchill does experience polar bears walking through because it happens to be on a polar bear migration route. 
The bears are walking to the coast and walking up north, uh, but most of the population is spread out quite a ways throughout Manitoba down the coast right now. Uh, so at any given day, you could see a couple polar bears in town, but there's going to be a lot more people. Absolutely, and of course, living in a place like this, the weather changes. Totally. Okay. Uh, right now, the weather is, what would you say? Joanna, what, what, did you check the weather forecast this morning? I did, actually, and uh, you will have to help me with the Fahrenheit okay. since <laughs> I operate in Celsius. Okay. But it was supposed to be around minus 16, but the wind is quite strong, so it can cool us down real quick. So I don't know what the, you know, what the relative temperature would be, but minus chilly. Yeah, chilly. We need our parkas outside for sure yeah. right now. Right, yeah. and so that's Celsius. Fahrenheit, it was supposed to be a, a warmer day from f when I looked at the forecast, about 20, 22 degrees. That feels like temperature, probably more like five, right? But I say that joking, but it is warmer. Yesterday was much mm -hmm. colder. Fahrenheit was about four uh, degrees mm -hmm. Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. just hovering around zero. So yeah, it's a pretty cold, pretty stark environment to see a creature like this that can, that can absolutely thrive. Um, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, so, Joanna, tell us a little bit about where you live, because I want to give the students a little bit of an understanding of your work and, and why you're here. But how does the climate uh, and wet, well, the weather compare to, to where, you, where you're from? Sure. So I live quite far north. I mean, as far north as um, people live really in communities like this. It's one of the further northernmost communities in the world. And it's uh, a Norwegian archipelago, so the set of islands high up Ar in the Arctic. However, it actually sits on the um, way of a warm Atlantic current co called Gulf Stream, which makes the climate there much milder than here in Churchill. So my friends back home, they experience temperatures that are you know, much more manageable, almost at the melting point uh, sometimes. And um, what's also special about this area in terms of polar bear habitat is, it, it, unlike here uh, in Western Hudson Bay, when we have a bay you know, uh, of, uh, surrounded by land, I live on an island surrounded by ocean. And polar bears living there, even though they're the same bears, they run into a little bit of a different situation uh, ice-wise. So polar bears, they really hope that the, they, they can connect to this ice cap that covers the Arctic Ocean and grows and shrinks with the season. So they're hoping that, you know, in the winter, the ice is growing and in spring it reaches really, it's, um, like it's uh, reaching so far that bears can hop on and start, you know, their feeding way all throughout then spring and summer and then autumn and, you know, even continue later in the year. So um, the area is also very mountainous. It's uh, unlike here where it's really flat and the tundra is, uh, you know, as far as you can see, it stretches out into the horizon. Svalbard is very mountainous. It has um, glaciers too, but polar bears also depend on sea ice there and that doesn't change. Wonderful. We're going to learn a little bit more about Svalbard, but before we do, I just want to say thank you to Miss Shields, all the students from Mitchellville. We see you. We see that you're joining us. That is awesome. Miss Cunningham and her students, we see you. We're so glad that you're joining us. Miss Shields, lots of photos coming in, comments, questions, keep them coming. We're going to have a little bit more of a Q&A session coming right up. But right now, let's learn a little bit more about how you study polar bears, because we're on Buggy One, we mentioned that. But you had a pretty fascinating opportunity last spring to go out out and study polar bear dens, right? Let's go ahead and look at a day in the life of what, what it's like where you live. My name is Joanna Sully. I'm a biologist. I live in Longebier and I'm taking part in the research project investigating the maternity denning of polar bears. We are placing cameras in front of polar bear dens and this gives us an opportunity to observe what happens when the polar bear mothers and their cubs emerge from the den for the very first time. Svalbard is an archipelago which is lying very far north in the Arctic, but at the same time it is placed right by the very warm ocean current that comes from the south. And the rate of climate warming here in Svalbard is twice as fast as any other areas this far north. So it gives us a really unique opportunity to see what climate change and environmental changes mean for polar bears. When deploying cameras, we go to a given location either by helicopter or by snowmobiles, but we're leaving machines in a safe distance in order not to disturb polar bear family. 
We then set up the camera, we add the solar panel to it so the batteries are continuously charged in times of good weather. We add additional camera traps that are um, monitoring the area by taking pictures in addition to video. And then we leave the area as fast as we can, hoping to get really good footage when the cameras are being picked up. My role is analyzing the data that we retrieve from the field and that really opens a window into seeing how bears behave, what's their condition, what's their reproduction status and how well they're doing in, in raising their young, about how playful they are and what this first moments of childhood outside of the den looks like. But also we can gain a deeper insight into environmental effects on this part of polar bear's life. Sometimes what's really striking is that when you go through footage, you get day after day, or like picture after picture, video after video of very harsh weather. The wind is howling, the snow is accumulating even on the lens. But then the sun hits or it becomes a little better. And then suddenly you see a head popping out and then another and another. And you realize that this kind of home of howling winds and blizzards is somebody's cradle. And this is the environment when future generations of bears are being raised in. That perspective, it's truly mind-blowing. It's so amazing every time we learn about the people behind the scenes that are doing everything they can to learn and then apply their expertise to study polar bears and to study animals and to help share that message, right? There's of course people behind the scenes right now making this happen, but the work that you do, analyzing that, that data, right? It's probably, it seems so exciting right now. And then you probably have those days where you're like, like you mentioned in the video, you're like looking at the data, looking for something and, and you're just not seeing it. So, um, so I just want the students to think about all those different careers that they might be able to follow. Photographers and videographers, not just polar bear scientists. There's so many other things that they might want to follow as they're getting older. So let's go ahead and learn because we're getting a lot of questions here. In fact, I had a couple shout out requests. I should, I should throw those out there too. Um, we had Edmonton, somebody that grew up in James Bay. Welcome. We're so glad you're with us today. Uh, Ms. Schwar from uh, New, uh, New Westminster in British Columbia, Canada. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wilson's class in Hemfield. Thank you for joining. So awesome. So excited that you're here with us. So myth or fact, lightning round, and we'll just kind of go back and forth unless I call out your name. So I think we'll start here with you, Elisa, okay? Myth or fact. Uh, actually, I'm going to go to Joanna because she was telling us about sea ice, and this is about sea ice. So myth or fact, students, once sea ice is frozen, it's stationary and it doesn't move. Myth or fact? Write it down. Once sea ice is stationary, or it's frozen, it's stationary, it does not move. Joanna. If you watch this video carefully and her listen to what I said later, you'll know it's a myth. The sea ice, it's frozen, but it's still just a layer on top of moving water, so it will move with the currents. It sometimes collides with itself and it can, you know, travel on the um, large, vast distances, a little bit like a conveyor belt. So polar bears live on a conveyor belt of a landscape, actually. Awesome. Myth or fact, here we go. Elisa, this one's for you. I know you know this answer. Uh, polar bears spend two and a half years to raise their cubs. Um, pretty close to fact. It's a little more like two and a third years, Ooh, though. Ooh, I yeah. like the technicality. Technicality. <laughs> fractions are tough. Yes. I love bring fractions in. Okay. Um, and, and, Joanna, you were telling me a little bit just about uh, how, how fascinating that is because they're so dependent on childhood. Can you t tell me what you are telling me earlier about that? Sure. I mean, when we look at adult polar bears, they seem like solitary animals. They really, you know, they go by themselves. But actually... Um, they are very, polar bears are very social in the first two and the third years of their life. Mm -hmm. So they spend this time with their mom. They, uh, they feed on milk for first around 10 months of their lifetime. Uh, and then they actually still stay with their mom to learn how to be bears, how to hunt, how to navigate this uh, tricky environment, how to avoid other bears that are maybe potentially dangerous. And you know, how to just thrive in an environment that takes time to, to learn. Yeah, pretty awesome. Okay, Elisa, to you, myth or fact, students, are you writing these down? Polar bear fur is white. Is it a myth or is it a fact? Mm -hmm. Polar bear fur is white. Myth. 
Polar bear fur is actually transparent. It's colorless. It just looks white to our eyes. It's also hollow and helps trap heat against the polar bear's body. It's pretty cool. Absolutely. One of those ad adaptations, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about adaptations in science. It helps them to thrive mm -hmm. in this environment. Absolutely. Okay, here's another one. Myth or fact, polar bears can communicate over several kilometers, even several miles. Myth or fact, polar bears can communicate over several kilometers or even miles. Myth, fact, myth, fact. Joanna? Actually, it's a fact. Because polar bears have different ways of communication than, you know, just speaking to each other. They don't do that as much as they actually talk to each other with their feet. So they get, you know, when polar bear female is ready to mate and meet a guy, her feet get really smelly in a good way. So she can walk over, you know, several, several miles, long distances, and then male can pick up that, uh, that scent and follow the female and find her out there in the ice. So that is a communication. Um, it's a scent communication. Yeah. It's pretty amazing, yeah. Let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about protecting polar bears and their mobs and cubs because that, that's why we're mm -hmm. here, right? Trying to see how the species is, is evolving and what's happening to them. So we're gonna go ahead and learn about polar bear moms and cubs. Standing is one of the most critical times in a polar bear's life cycle. The Arctic is an extremely harsh climate with cold temperatures and howling winds female polar bears den and give birth to their young underneath the snow. This den is critical and it keeps them safe while they're very, very young and vulnerable to the outside conditions. It's important that cubs remain in the den with their mother, undisturbed, so they can grow and develop. If you want adult bears, you need to have baby bears coming into the population. Protection of denning polar bears is super important for their long-term conservation. Without the protection of females and their cubs through the denning process, we're not gonna have healthy populations going forward. We have to find ways to protect dens under the snow. Initially, we looked at forward-looking infrared, something that sees a thermal signature coming out of the snow is very promising, but it relies on very stable weather conditions in the Arctic, and that's been changing over the years. We don't see that stability and so that tool has been less effective than we hoped. And that's why we've changed to looking at synthetic aperture radar, ground penetrating radar that can see underneath the snow and is not weather dependent. It is really difficult for us to be able to locate exactly where these dens are, especially in a place that's so vast as the Arctic. This landscape is massive. Lots of things have been tried to locate dens. You could just spend time in the area driving around on your snowmobile, maybe skiing, maybe walking, and look for snow holes. This is super time consuming. And that led this down the path of synthetic aperture radar. SAR is not an imaging technique like a camera, but instead it's radar. And each one of the pixels, each one of the pieces of information that SAR gathers is actually geo-reference. It's a spot on the map. And so when we go out and we look for bears, it actually gives us a place somewhere out there to go repeat and look again, or maybe go visit afterwards to be able to ground truth. So it's, it's got a ton of possibilities. The other neat thing about synthetic aperture radar, we don't have to be on top of the den. We don't even have to be anywhere near the den. We can be something like 4,000 feet above the den in an aircraft and probably not even noticeable by the female down below in the snow. Developing a new tool, a reliable tool for polar bear den detection is critical to our work of polar bear conservation. If we can't protect denning females, we're not going to have successful reproduction in some of these subpopulations that are already challenged by melting sea ice. Polar bears spend most of their lives outside of the view of humans. In order to really truly help this animal, we need better information. And a lot of times that's remote sensing or some sort of remote tracking techniques that allow us to understand what's going on out there with their habitat, where they're spending their time, the more we know about an animal, the better we can protect that animal. In the end, if this project is successful, we will be able to image polar bears underneath the snow. We will be able to know exactly where a denning female and her cubs are beneath the surface. If we can locate dens, sure it helps with research, but it also helps with protecting these animals. If we can know exactly where they are, we can tell other folks that maybe want to do work in these areas to say, hey, we need to stay away from this critical spot during this time of year. 
Polar bears are a long-lived species, and so we really have to take a look at these animals over a long period of time in order to notice trends or changes that are happening. Their habitat is changing at a rapid rate. Some of these long-term projects that have gone on for 30 or 40 years are able to unlock some of these findings that tell us that they are in trouble and that they need help. Long-term monitoring and projects in general, research projects, help us understand an animal in greater depth and hopefully help us find solutions in order to help protect that animal. With support from you, we can continue. Synthetic Aperture Radar, SAR. That was a new one to me. If you can say it 10 times fast, you'll be saying it on the way home from school, maybe on the school bus, however you get home, it'll be pretty fascinating because I was saying that one, can I get it out? I'm not quite sure, but it's so interesting how they continue to find ways, like VJ did in that video, of applying technology to learn about the environment. I, I think that's a passion of mine, and so seeing that is just really, really cool. Okay, myth or fact, are you ready? Here's one, were you listening closely? You learned something in that video, they touched upon it, kind of danced around it, Here's the myth or fact. All polar bears hibernate throughout the winter. All polar bears hibernate throughout the winter. Myth, fact. Okay, we give them wait time. That's definitely a myth. Polar bears don't hibernate. The only bears we see go into dens over the winter are the pregnant females who are giving birth over the winter. The rest of the polar bears, of course, are using that winter to find seals and get fat again. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Like they're always on the road, yeah. uh, on the roam. How far do polar bears travel in their lifetime? Do you have any idea, Lisa? That varies hugely. So when we look across the whole range of the polar bear, we see very different home range sizes. There are some bears in James Bay, in part of the Hudson Bay, that have small home ranges, maybe 20 to 30,000 square kilometers. So that's pretty small. And then in places like where Joanna lives, those home ranges can be up to 600,000 square kilometers. So I think that's bigger than the state of Texas even, or may at least say the state of California. It's anyway, huge, yeah. massive. They're in fact the most mobile, we think, four-legged animal out there traveling huge distances, so they're walking more than any other four-legged animal, uh, which I think is pretty cool when you think about all the animals. Part of that might be because of the shifting sea ice, too. Just got to find those seals. It's amazing. Do what it takes. When I think yep. about energy, you know, and both yeah. what they have to consume because of how much energy they're spending, right? That's a yes. lot of movement. Always walking, yeah. nonstop, right? How many calories do they have to pull in from a seal? Ooh, do you know that? That'd be a good myth or fact. I don't know. Any, any stats? There's a kind of a random <laughs> quiz question popped into my mind, but... Yeah, I, well, I will say that seal blubber is one of the most calorically or energy dense foods on the whole planet. And polar bears can eat over 100 pounds of blubber at one sitting. And that's a ton of energy. This is why they need to eat seals. There's no other food on the planet that can power a polar bear like seal blubber does. And again, that's because they have these huge home ranges. They live in this harsh environment. They need the food. They need the energy. They need seal blubber. Awesome. Joanna, you had a, a prop there, if you can hold it yeah. up. I believe it was the uh, kind of the size. Sure. Yeah, tell us, what is that? You want a high five? Yeah. <laughs> that gives a perspective, right? Yeah. Wow. So here's a myth or fact. As the students are looking at this polar bear paw or the imprint of it, right? Um, polar bears don't slide on the ice. Myth or fact? Polar bears don't slide mm. on the ice. Hmm. It's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. I would say they don't if they don't want to. They can certainly slide on the ice, they can wash themselves, you know, or just like rub themselves in the ice and snow if they want to. So you've seen maybe some of the pictures of bears rubbing, but if they don't want to slide, if they want to, you know, be sure that they get the seal or walk very carefully, actually they're very, the build of their feet helps them with that. So they have excellent, excellent traction. And um, those black pads that you see underneath the polar bear's feet, they actually have a small structures like bumps uh, called papilla, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm not, uh, it's, a, it's a new word for me, so um, it's hard to pronounce it. I'm sure it's new for papilla. them too. Let's put it on them. Go look up. Yeah, How do you yeah. say papilla? Right there. So these are those little bumps that actually increase the, um, the grip that, and then it really works like the best world's best winter tires out there in the ice. And what also is very cool that sea, uh, sea ice is less slippery when it's colder. So the colder it is, the better it's going to be for bears to get that traction. Very cool. That is so awesome. So mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you. So many questions coming in. Uh, just another minute to give some shout outs because we're seeing um, Miss Schmal's class in Virginia learning about polar bears from Canada. Thank you so much for joining us. Miss uh, Langston, she wanted to know how many Col uh, polar bear uh, cubs do do the polar bears usually have at one time? Did we answer that? I'm um, not really. We haven't covered it, and it's on 
two on average. But it's really actually hard to raise a cub and it's hard to make it to adulthood. So the survival rate for cubs in their first year, it's around 50%. Wow, okay, interesting. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Ms. Compu, also coming from Belleville, Ontario. Thank you to all the students on Ontario joining us. There's just so many students here. Uh, Ms. Hernandez, your class says hi. We say hi right back to you. We're so glad you're looking. In fact, uh, hopefully you saw earlier in the program, the bears walked away from us. There's two bears sparring. Don't worry, this is being recorded. That's one of the amazing things. You can come back, you can watch it again and learn about all of these myths or facts. So here's, here's one of my last myths or facts. I'd like to, for you to think about this, students. Even in your classroom, you can do something to protect polar bears. Myth or fact? Even in your classroom, you can do something to protect polar bears. Yeah, that's a complex one, but I think you probably have an idea. Joanna, what do you think you can do? What can these students do to protect polar bears if they're, you know, uh, in, in grade four or fourth grade, or maybe they're in seventh grade, right? I think you're actually doing it right now. This is great. Like you are learning all this information that you can take with yourselves and then talk about it. You can share everything that you're learning here with your family, with your teachers, with people around you, and make sure that this perspective is included in the conversation that we keep having. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great answer. And I think uh, I want to remind you that it's not up to you students to solve climate change. It is up to the adults to put the actions in place to move us away from fossil fuels and toward renewable energies. But your voices matter in that. You can talk to the adults in your life Depending on who's around you, talk to your teachers, you could talk to your principal. Maybe you need a new school bus for your school and maybe it can be electric. Uh, maybe you can talk to your parents and just ask them, you know, what kind of vehicle are we driving? Are there any kind of community programs? Your voices truly do matter. And there are things we can do every day. And the biggest thing is to shift our society in the direction of a cleaner future, to protect the future for you and to protect the future for polar bears. But you really do have influence and your voice counts. Absolutely. And I couldn't reiterate that more. We're so thankful that you're learning with us yes, today. I can't believe that we're coming near the end of our time. It's been so fast, um, but we want you to continue exploring. It's one of the things that we're so thankful for, Discovery Education is, uh, for Polar Bears International, for inviting us up here to yeah. see this incredible environment, to bring students along on this wonderful experience. Um, it's just amazing, and there are so many teams behind the scenes, right, that go ahead and, and give time and effort um, and money and things to just make this happen. So to all all those all those gifts they're all just so generous the supporters that make this happen so thank you thank you thank you and teachers there's so much more you can do hopefully this is just the starting point we have a number of resources already for you on our event website the polar bears learning adventure breaks apart many of the segments that we talked about today mm -hmm. want to go learn more about buggy one we have an activity ready for you want to learn about heredity and traits or ecosystems we have that ready for you so please go ahead and check that out share it with your students and polar bears international your website mm -hmm. so many things right to learn Tundra Connections every fall, join live. Anything else that you want the teachers to know and the students? Yeah, I'll just say, yeah, ch check out our website. One cool thing is our polar bear tracker. Just this week, we're starting to follow polar bears across Hudson Bay on their winter journeys. It's really neat every week to see where the bears go. And then, just as Kyle said, we've got lessons, units, activities, art ideas, lots of just great ways to learn more, follow your curiosity, and yeah, just keep being what you're doing. Keep being who you're being. You guys are great, and thank you so much for being interested in polar bears. We really appreciate it. That's going to help us protect them and protect our futures, too. Excellent. Last myth or fact, Ooh. I'm going to stay warm while in the tundra. <laughs> oh, of course. That's a fact. We You're nice this. and warm. We've got this. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, everyone. <laughs> thank you for joining us. We're so glad that you did so. Have an excellent rest of your day. And, of course, of course, you join us for our Q&A this afternoon if you're available. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.